So thank you again for being here, all of you. My name is Dave Elving. I'm the interim executive director here at San Francisco Camera Work. And when we can't gather together physically, it's important for us to come together virtually to celebrate the arts, but also to have important conversations. As a nonprofit organization, we rely on your support to make programs like this happen. Lots of new faces are here today, so if you're not already a member, please visit our website at sfcamerawork.org where you can learn more about us uh, and join us. Today, we are proud to host a student-led dialogue between photography majors at California College of the Arts here in San Francisco and Georgia State University in Atlanta, Georgia on the issue of, vo of voting. There couldn't be anything more important or more timely, so we're excited to have everyone here today. Jason Brody, from CCA here in San Francisco, will kick off the conversation and get us started. Jason. Hello, welcome everybody. Um, before I give the brief introduction, I do have a short video that kind of outlined kind of the process of how we did this. So I'm gonna play that first and then we'll get going. everyone. Hello, hello, and welcome. My name is Jason Brody, and I'm a Bay Area-based photographer and member of the Investigations 3 class at California College of the Arts. Thank you all so much for joining us today as we delve into the... Thank you so much for joining us today as we delve into the voting stories of four pairs of students on separate coasts. Both classes were given the same reading material and prompts regarding the voting story, voting plan, and then were asked to record five minute artist introductions, as well as one image that contributed to their voting story that were posted for the other class to see. The classes were then paired off into groups and one to two hour interviews were conducted. The idea was to examine the perspective differences and similarities between both classes through the medium of photography and personal experience. The projects explored themes such as voter suppression and the legacy of white supremacy in politics. This project was incredible to work on. And you can see the end result of our labor at the online exhibition. The link is in the chat. Each artist's website or Instagram is a clickable link of their photo, so feel free to check everyone involved out. The grant that enabled us to embark on this journey came from CCA's own Creative Citizens in Action in association with the Deborah and Kenneth Novak Citizens Series. Creative Citizens in Action is a college-wide initiative that promotes creative activism and democratic engagement through public programs, exhibitions, and curriculum connections. We'd like to thank the faculty that made this possible as well, Aspen May at CCA, and Joshua Dudley Greer, and Jill Frank at Georgia State University. We thank you. I'd also like to thank the Georgia State University Portfolio One class, especially Tyler Branton as the GCA at GSU CCA student liaison, and my own CCA Investigations 3 class for this collaborative opportunity. 
as well as Christina Graber and Dave Elving and the whole SF Panwork team for hosting this. Most importantly, I'd like to welcome our moderator tonight, Chanel Stone. Chanel Stone is a photographer living and working in Oakland, California. Stone earned her BFA in photography from the California College of the Arts in 2019. Her practice focuses on challenging insular views of blackness by expanding on narrative subject to black erasure. Stone's notable accomplishments include her solo exhibition, Natura Negra, at the Museum of African Diaspora, San Francisco, her inclusion in the 2019 Aperture Summer Open at the Aperture Foundation, New York, and being a selected finalist for the 2020 Artavia San Francisco Award. Stone's practice was featured in W Magazine's Young Photographers to Follow in 2000. Welcome, Chanel Stone. Hi everyone, I'm happy to be here this evening. Thank you all for tuning in and joining with us today on this dialogue. And just, um, I hope that you are well, wherever you are in the country. So many of us are spread apart um, in various regions. So thank you for gathering here today with us. Today, um, we're gonna start off with our first group, which is Morgan Guerra and Tyler Brantley. Morgan is a student at CCA and Tyler is a student at Georgia State University. And we're going to begin shortly when um, the slideshow is get started. Okay, so um, Morgan, let's start off with you and can you say a few things about yourself and, or we'll start off with Tyler. <laughs> can we say a few things about yourself and your practice? Uh, hi everybody. Um, so my work is basically, it's been examining like identity and the body and, uh, sort of gender stereotypes. And, um, I don't know, I've just basically been trying to find lots of different tools to express kind of being caught in the middle between masculine and feminine roles. So that's it in a nutshell. <laughs> sure. And Morgan? Hi, my name is Morgan. Um, currently going to CCA, going to be in my, or I am in my last semester, graduating in December. Um, I am from San Antonio, Texas. And I, before I came to CCA, I was studying business school. Um, I was in business school and my parents were just kind of like, oh, like you got to do this. Like this is a stable, like outcome for your life. And um, they are kind of like art school. Like where did that come from? Like you're the black sheep of the family. Like, when did we drop you as a child? Just kidding. Um, but that like really pushed me to focus on like what I really wanted. And after a year of business school, I decided to transfer out to CCA and I've been here for the past two and a half years now. Um, and as far as my work right now, um, I have never spent so much time in my house, um, which is like really crazy. Just uh, our photography campus is in Oakland and I live in San Francisco. So between commuting and just taking pictures and I was also employed part-time, um, I literally was never home. So right now I've just been exploring a lot of things inside my, but um, my work really focuses on the outside world and the way we, we interact with it and how it kind of responds to us, I guess I would say. Definitely, and the two of you also are looking at um, our relationship to the natural world as well, right? Both of your works, right? Great, um, so can you tell us a bit about your voting experiences and your personal voting story? Also, if this is your first time voting in the election, um, I would love to hear more about that. You want me to go first? You go first. Um, you go first. <laughs> uh, okay, um, so my voting story was uh, the collage, if you saw the black and white collage of chaos. Um, I'm 23, so this is my second election to be voting in. Um, and just growing up, I, uh, live in, I lived in San Antonio, but we also lived in a small suburb. Um, and it was very, very Republican. Um, and politics weren't really talked about um, very openly in just like my Texas life. Um, but it was always something that we did as a family and it felt like an obligation um, almost that my parents would always like drag me along for, but I was always down to just go with them and stand in line and like look at the barren walls and just there to get candy pretty much. Um, 
but the collage kind of um, like the collage of chaos kind of reflects like the chaos of our 2020 election and just this year as a whole and um, just like the circus of clowns running our government and just in control of a lot of um, our lives to a certain extent. And uh, Tyler, how about you? Can you explain your voting story, your past experiences, if this is your first election? Um, it's not my first election. Um, I've, I've been several now. Uh, the first one was like Bush, Kerry, 2004. Yeah. So it's been a minute. Um, I feel like a, a running theme, at least being from a more conservative state, is you kind of get used to being slightly disappointed a lot. <laughs> because I mean I always vote you know kind of more liberal and then it usually doesn't go well um thank god for Obama that that gave me some some hope much needed boost of hope but um yeah um you kind of feel outnumbered a little sometimes and like your voice isn't as strong as you would like it to be you know and um I guess just it's like you have to learn to be optimistic but realistic at the same time is, yeah, the gist of it. And um, personally, I've never had any like issues, like having to stand in really long lines or, or you know, being afraid that I'm going to be denied for some ridiculous reason to vote. But um, learning about that, like all the obstacles that other people face, and then thinking of how easy it's been for me every time, like it makes me think, it makes me take it even more seriously and realize that you know I have to appreciate it and do it every single time no matter what you know because other people just I mean hours and hours in line I you know I have to do what I can so and plus even though like I'm a little more pessimistic these days um right after I cast my ballot I still feel slightly excited every single time like you feel like you're just accomplishing something important you know so and that has never gone away so that's a plus. Definitely. And with that interesting thing between you two is the fact that you have both lived in the South and the West Coast. You spent time in both regions, both totally different. I'm wondering how has that influenced you as artists, um, your perspectives, and as well as with this voting narrative that we're expanding on? Feel free to take it away if you want to be on. You go first. <laughs> Tyler, do you want to go first? Oh, okay. Um, I, are you, I'm going to, I'll go. Um, so from Texas, I've been here for two and a half years now. Um, so for 20 years of my, 21 years of my life, I was in San Antonio um, and would travel, but just like really hadn't spent time outside one of the country, but just like outside of like living in San Antonio. So the change um, to California was like really drastic and very much of a culture shock. And um, it was just, yeah, something that I was like not familiar with at all. And that change was just like pretty drastic for me. Um, but growing up in Texas, I mean, I lived in San Antonio, so it's not like we don't ride our horses to school, um, but we do have a lot of space <laughs> compared to San Francisco or just like an urban environment. Um, and so I was always surrounded by a lot of space and was like always outside and I think that's where my like real like uh love of like nature and just like being outdoors came from um and so like when I moved to San Francisco and I was like really intrigued by like the like the landscape was intriguing to me and just every like I was living in such like an urban environment but I was also surrounded by like everything was in like a really close distance and coming from Texas, I say a close distance is like three hour radius. So like you had Yosemite, like uh, like the Southern or Highway One and just like all this beautiful um, nature. But also I, when I moved to San Francisco, I noticed like the abundant um, presence of technology. And um, there's this author called Kevin Kelly and he was talking there, I had taken a class and he was talking about um, how everything's to become autonomous and nature is only to be accessible to thought that was like really scary um and I don't know I living in Texas I always had this like um image of San Francisco being very artistic and 
full of culture, which it still is, but I definitely think like technology is taking over and I'm still wavering in between of is technology good or bad? And there's so many pros and so many cons. So there's definitely not a black or white answer, but Tyler. Tyler, how about you navigating between the South and the West Coast? How's that influenced you and with your practice, but along with your voting story? Um, well, I lived in Portland, Oregon for about a year. Well, I also lived in Hawaii for a year, but um, in Portland, like they have the whole motto, like keep Portland weird. And um, it's, it was really eye opening to just be in a place that like embraced, it was like extremely liberal there, like was, which was very, very different from what I was used to basically. And um, it kind of just makes you feel like a little less crazy when you realize, oh, the world is actually much larger and there are more people that think like I do, you know, and they, they exist and, and they, they have, you know, like businesses and they're just like real people. And they, <laughs> you know, it just makes, it's very validating is what it is. And um, it kind of just broadened my horizons, you know, and um, it made me want to question like where I came from even more, you know, and like what I see that's wrong with it. and and how it can change. And so it's it's definitely good to just at least leave for a little while so that you can re-examine all the things, you know, that you come from, so. Yeah, and that's interesting. I feel like the point of this conversation too is like to dispel this myth between the South and the West. Like we have these preconceived ideas of either region. And um, since y'all have navigated both, do you feel like your perspective has shifted as a whole, just being in these radically different parts of the country. Um, curious about that. I'm trying, you said, have our perspective shifted? I feel like mine hasn't shifted so much, but, or I guess maybe it has shifted to the sense of, I feel like more strong about certain ideas and certain points and feel like I have more of a backbone to correct like a family member when they say something that's like not like correct or just have like a different idea and I feel like I can really have like that debate um like I had a phone call with my sister yesterday and we were making some deep rooted points towards one another and just um political views which um got a little interesting but I definitely feel like I just like being over there um you almost get like clouded, which I guess can happen anywhere you are, but you get clouded of what's around you and like all the information and like media that's coming towards you from this one side. Um, but once you like leave a certain area, you can get a little bit more of a perspective on both sides, I guess I would say. Yeah. Yeah, I agree with that. Um, I don't think it it changed my views so much is is so much as it like emboldened me, you know, to to think the way that I do. I mean, made me accept it more and like be like, there are other people like you out there and this is totally rational. And it makes you just, um, I don't know, want to fight more for what you believe in, you know, stronger. <laughs> yeah. And with that, I have a question um, that I'm gonna ask every group tonight, it's very important. And that is, how do you see the role of artists changing and shaping ideas in this post-COVID world that we'll soon be um, encroaching on in light of this election year. How do you feel like we are agency in this or do you feel optimistic, things of that nature? Um, I was, I'll go, I'll go. I was joking with a, um, a teacher the other day that like the future of photography is basically, it's gonna be nothing but landscapes and self portraits from now on. <laughs> because those are the only safe things to do now. But um, I don't know, that might be true, but I, I feel like there's gonna be a lot more um, examining of, of like all the social situations that we kind of took for granted beforehand, you know? And like, I don't know, probably lots of projects like directed towards examining um, like the need to connect with others and like how that's changed through this whole process, you know, and how the role that technology has played in that. Like I see probably a lot of that coming in the future. 
if we get back to any kind of normal soon. So what are your thoughts on that, Morgan? Yeah, I'm super optimistic. I mean, I came into 2020 with like, this is my full senior, like I'm going to do the most. And the world is kind of like, no, like maybe next year. Um, so yeah, I'm super optimistic about, I guess, the future of artists. And I just think like right now, I mean, everyone's like, I feel like I feel like a lot of people are drained, but a lot of people are also um, like really excited about the future. And we're really having to like navigate these different spaces and uh, figure out different ways to share things that are like that still communicate like effectively via screen or like displaying window or images in a window or just like public artwork. So I think there's a lot to come within the next like couple years um, as far as art and yeah, I really, I mean, some technology is like the main thing that um, I guess I was like really focused on when I first came to CCA and it's definitely like technology is just like a whole broad thing because everything is like technology, right? Um, but yeah, I just think that there's like so many like, like uh, projects that can go off of that. And um, mm -hmm. yeah, I think technology is like a really big like question, like, is it good or bad? There's so many great things that it's doing for so many people and it was designed to alleviate a lot of um what some people might say pain or just like bring people closer together but I feel like it's maybe become too a part of us that we can't like maybe this time has let people shake technology off a little bit and really get outdoors more and just I don't know oh, being okay. to talk to one another more face to face or whenever you can do that safely Definitely. Well, I thank you too for um, having this dialogue with me and thank you. Your work is beautiful. Keep going with it. And we're gonna segue into our next group. Thank you so much. So, so I'm gonna turn the slides to our next group, but I also just wanted to let everyone know that um, if you have any questions for the participants uh, this afternoon, please feel free to put them in the chat um, and we're gonna raise them at the end um, of tonight's session. And I'll hand it back to you, Chanel. Thanks, Christina. So our next group will be um, Housen Wong and Riley McBride. Okay, so Riley and Housem, thank you for being here with me tonight to discuss your work as well as these other themes that we're covering today. And Riley, would you mind um, starting us off with a little yeah. bit about yourself? For sure. Uh, my name is Riley and I am a student at Georgia State right now. Um, I'm in my second to last semester, which feels crazy. I feel like I've been in college forever, but also not complaining because I really like school. But um, yeah, I, I think a lot of my work is a, like is about identity and like figuring out who I am in this in the space and in the time now. I don't know, just uh, examining like the interpersonal relationships in my life and that being like romantic and non romantic partners, kind of examining those relationships and like where everyone stands and like the fluidity um in which intimacy can exist between all of those people that yeah kind of like the complex relationships anyways um yeah I'm really interested in like people and also like how I connect to the landscape that's really important to me so sure and can you also explain a bit about your voting story and voting experience once again is this your first election is it not things like that. Yeah, um, it's not my first election, but, um, or not but, but I have never had to wait that long. I feel like that is a privilege, but I've seen, I'm very nervous because I feel like everyone has had to wait so long um, for this one. And it seems like things are happening, like places are closing or like, oh, this, uh, this place is closed because the, um, 
computers aren't working or whatever. And I'm like, hmm, interesting timing. Uh, but um, yeah, I've had the privilege of not having to wait, which feels like that might not be the case this time. And also, um, where are you from originally? Are you from Georgia? I'm from Georgia. Um, no, funny story. I just got like a free ancestry two week trial or whatever. And I'm like really from Georgia. Like my whole family is from Georgia. So, yeah. Okay. Yeah. And housing, would you mind um, telling us a bit about yourself, your work and your stories and experiences with um, voting? Yeah. Um, thank you, Chanel. And thank you, Wally. Um, be my um, partner today. Um, and this is Hao San Wong, despite um, the spelling of my name is in Pinyin. But yes, speaking of spelling, I'm from, um, I'm from Canton City, AKA Guangzhou, uh, a, a southern city in China. And um, I guess I, I pretty special here because uh, I'm an international student. And uh, among all of the interviewers, interviewees, I don't have the right to vote. Uh, I do want to share my uh, voting story to you guys. Um, yes, I have zero experience about voting and I can't vote either in my country, which is China or here in the US. But um, first of all, I, uh, I want to thank you. I want to thank my girlfriend, um, Corey Chang, who is an amazing artist and a, a educator. Uh, we, she is also an alien in this country, and we brainstorm, uh, brainstorm about our voting story. And um, finally, we kind of ended up with um, the our an, ambiguous role in this uh, 2020 elections. And um, in terms of my, in terms of my work, um, because I uh, related to my background, I came from uh, um, a, you know Canton city, and I pretty excited about my own culture, which is. Cantonese culture. So, um, and I moved here several years ago, and I like I never, I never um, feel the existence of my own culture because, um, uh, you know, when you're growing up with uh, environment, you can, like, you oftentimes you can feel the tangible aspect of your of your own culture. But uh, when I'm after I moved here, I feel like. Um, my my culture is so unique, and because of San Francisco here, San Francisco it's a pretty special city where a large uh, Cantonese population live, and um, so my work really um, focused on uh, researching about the Cantonese culture as well as the U.S. culture, like um, the interconnection between um, between them, and then lead me to explore more about the Western and Eastern uh, values together. Yeah. So um, my next question would be, how Zim, can you share with us um, your experience being an international student in the US? You talked a little bit about it already, but what motivated you to study here? And then you mentioned how you do not have the right to vote, but still the politics here affect the world in a sense. And in the summer, visa statuses were threatened for international students. And I would love to hear um, how that impacted you too. Yeah. Um, thank you. Um, so I guess the reason uh, why I studied abroad is, um, yeah, I think we had, like my family had a lot of reasons, but one of the most important one is that uh, studying abroad is or was, I don't know, uh, a kind of trend in, in Chinese middle class families. So um, yeah, I guess that's pretty big influence of the decision that I, um, I'm here studying arts. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, I think I have so many things to share about um, like what's the experience like being an uh, international student in the US, but uh, I do want to share with just only one thing, uh, which is language barriers. Um, like speaking, speaking another language other than from your mother tongue is a, it's way difficult than just having conversation. Um, uh, the reason why I said that is, uh, is that you have to deal with all kinds of translation um, in the conversation or even some names that you even that you never heard of like 
for example, talking like going back to the to the topic t today or tonight um, about voting, mm -hmm. and um, I don't know how to fully translate the term proposition or props into Chinese language context because um, first of all, um, it's it's unnecessary to translate into Chinese, and the second we didn't have the chance to to learn all the concept about election in mainly in China, you know. Um, uh, what's the what's the, the next second, question? Sorry. The second part of the question was um, the fact that American politics has like this ripple effect globally. So I wanted to know like how did that impact you in the summer when like visa statuses were threatened for international students in particular? Um, what is saying that is an impact? I feel like um, it's kind of like a special experience because um, I cannot do anything for it, but um, thanks to some university in the country, um, my right to start here can like get to continue. And um, I think there's a, a turning point to my, to either my great creative work and also um, my life is that uh, last year the, during the Hong Kong, um, um, like a series of Hong, uh, uh, protests in Hong Kong, and also as well as the uh, uh, Black, Life, Black Lives Matter movement here to, uh, this year, uh, I feel like politics is a pretty important factor in terms of like making art or as well as like, a, you know, daily life, because you have to like, um, if you if you don't, if, if you ignore it, politics will always get to you. Definitely. So Riley, um, I wanted to hear about your experiences, um, you know, navigating like the student body at Georgia State University. Are there very many international students to begin with? And um, are the majority of the students even from Georgia? I know that you said you're Georgia born and raised and how has that shaped the culture of like your experience there, et cetera? Um, I was trying to find some like data as far as like the Georgia State student body. And I don't know if this is recent at all, but it was like a thousand students out of 30 plus thousand. That could be way off. But um, I don't think that we have that many international students in the art pro or the photo program. And so like being able to hear the experiences um, of the folks in California has been like really eye-opening because that's not something that we hear about um, often like in our class. But um, what was the other question? Oh no, that was, that was basically it. I just wanted to hear <laughs> okay. the culture of um, Georgia State, for instance, like with this idea of like, is it a mixed group of students from different parts of the country, let alone internationally? I was curious yeah. about that. Um, yeah, I feel like a, a lot of us are from Georgia, but then there are the select few that, um, or from the South, I guess, and then the select few like Tyler who have lived in like different parts of the country, but have sort of navigated back. Um, yeah. Okay. And my next question for you two are, um, can you talk about how your home life has influenced your work and how do you see um, the subject presenting itself in your work um, conceptually? Um, you both mentioned having grown up in conservative families, from what I understand. Um, yeah, I think I'll go first, sorry. Um, um, as you can see in the slides, uh, my home life definitely has a big influence and impact in my works. Um, but I don't think the influence is a, it's all about politics. And I think it's more on the aspect of traditional canonist lifestyle and values. Um, and as I mentioned, after I went here in California, I was excited but nostalgic at the same time because, um, because I really wanted to um, learn and fuse myself into the uh, local culture or English speaking culture. Uh, meanwhile, I finally noticed my uh, the existence of my own culture. So I started to explore uh, the interconnection between the two environments that I have experienced. How about you, Riley? Um, 
I think as far as coming from a conservative family and not being a conservative person, um, there's like a freedom in my in the images that I'm like really able to explore in a way that I maybe wasn't so when I lived with um, my family and I'm like very loudly saying like, hello, I am a queer woman existing in a space. And um, and I, yeah, I think with, with art, there comes this voice that I'm like, oh, okay, I can like shout these things out and, you know, there may be repercussions that follow, but I feel, uh, I feel like I have a voice within the images. So during um, the quarantine, were you at home a lot making this work? Yeah, I was, I start, it's weird because I started making the work at home um, before quarantine started and then quarantine hit and I was like, oh, this changes very little. But um, so that worked out well. But uh, yeah, I think definitely even after quarantine, like the domestic space is something that I would like to explore, continue to explore. Definitely. And a similar question that I asked the other group is, how do you see the role of artists changing and shaping ideas in how we imagine a post-COVID world um, in light of the election happening this year? Um, I'm still pretty, um, I'll say, I'm still pretty confused about my role in um, this year's election, but I am pretty optimistic about um, the art versus uh, the polit political environment. Um, like in terms of a more general angle, I mean, uh, I think art could be a, a good medium to restore um, the turn, the tone, society or polarized society um, that Trump caused in the U.S. And I think being an artist or making art can be a good uh, method to restore it. Riley, what are your thoughts on that? Um. I think that opportunities that, I mean, it feels hard to believe, but opportunities to communicate with other people. Like, I, I feel like if COVID didn't happen, we wouldn't even be having this conversation right now. Um, so I think there will definitely be more community uh, with people who have similar or dissimilar ideas. Um, I Yeah, I feel like people in a way are like reaching so hard to communicate with each other because we can't uh, now in person. And that has like opened up even more, um, more dialogue than I thought it would. I think, yeah, that's a loaded question, but <laughs> I definitely yeah. think it's the idea of it's community. Been yeah, it's an interesting question, only because this year I feel like has like radically shifted so much to where we're having conversations that we normally wouldn't have had just even a year ago. Yeah. And in all of this political turmoil with the protests, the election, et cetera, it just seems like an opportunity to create something different. Um, despite what happens in the election, there's still this idea of like people coming together more and um, moving towards a society that we see fit for each other. And of course, artists have a major role in that because um, imagery impacts us so deeply, as well as like just bringing ideas to light that um, others may have overlooked. So it is a loaded question, but always interested to hear other perspectives on it. And yeah, do you, do you all have anything else you would like to say about your work or just with the voting in general? I don't, I don't think I have anything else to say about the work, but thank you for being here. Yeah. Um, I guess, um, yeah, I guess everybody in this Zoom would know the importance of voting. So go vote. Thank you. Definitely. OK, 
Okay, we're moving on to our next group next. Thank you, Hausam and Riley. Thank you so much. And for our audience, feel free to keep putting questions in the chat. At the end, we will have a group Q&A. So some of these questions they may have had for a particular group, a particular student, we'll have opportunity to discuss those um, later. So just keep putting them in, we're keeping track. And our next group, we have Nia Hemet from Georgia State University and Astrid Hernandez from CCA. And we're gonna kick it off with Nia. And can you tell me a bit about your practice and your voting experience? Okay. Hi, my name is Nia Hemet. Um, I'm from Atlanta, Georgia, currently going to Georgia State University in my senior year, thank God. Um, so my work is primarily about community, um, several different communities being that, mainly, not mainly, <laughs> one of which being the community around my house where I live currently in the West End of Atlanta, Georgia. Um, I'm really interested in the dynamics of this side of town and the kind of decay that has become of this side of town. It's not really taken care of as well as other sides that have more money. Um, so I'm kind of focusing on that basically. Um, and I also focus on communities in like the LGBTQ community and the Gothic community, which is, just dropped something on the floor, it's okay. Which is <laughs> a community that I am a part of, yeah. And can you tell us about your voting story, um, first election, not your first election, your experiences? Um, this would be my second election. So the first time around when I voted, it was very, very long. It was, I probably waited in line for like three hours. Um, and this was downtown, like near Georgia State campus. So this was where most of the students were coming to vote. Um, they were coming and like handing out bags of like snacks and stuff and like shirts that said I'm black and I vote because I guess it's a predominantly like black area so they were really trying to like, you know, get people to go vote. Um, so I guess that that worked. Um, but handing out food is a really good way to keep people from leaving. So I think that that's something that should continue, especially if they're going to continue to not um, not have various polling sites, you know, to where we don't have to wait as long. Yeah. And Astrid, would you mind um, saying a few things about your practice along with your voting story? If it's the first election, if it's not. Um, it is not my first election. My first election was Donald Trump versus Hillary. <laughs> and um, yeah, I've never really had a hard time voting. Like, it was just something that I would do while I was walking my dog, which he enjoyed. And yeah, um, but voting in politics is something I'm super invested in. Yes. Yeah. And would you mind, Astrid, going into a bit about your work, what you focus on? Yeah, um, so I'll, I'll, I'll give you guys a little bit of my background. Um, I started working, well, actually, I'll say that I grew up in a household full of immigrants. So I was raised by immigrants from Denmark, Israel, Nicaragua, and El Salvador. So religion and um, just all these political standards were just not forced onto me. It was just always been um, embraced diversity. So I have, al I've always seen that as a privilege, which is why I like, I love to speak up and I've never been told to not uh, speak out about stuff that I feel very um, passionate about. So um, it's been great having such an encouraging uh, experience or encouraging, um, yeah. But um, I started working in marketing when I was just a teenager. And then, so photography wasn't my path at all until I was about 22. And I decided to quit my old dream job because uh, I realized it wasn't my true dream job because I realized what was more important to me was like the, like the tool of photography being um, used as a way to get closer to others and getting to know their story. Um, I would say I am a very chaotic but good person. So I bring that chaos out of people in a good way, just to embrace like 
their true self and they feel totally comfortable to be themselves. Thank you, Astrid. So Nia, I'm really interested in hearing your story of um, how you came to photography and hearing more about that. Okay, so I've honestly had a long journey with photography. I first came about on photography when I was in like sixth grade. Um, I got on Tumblr for the first time and that kind of just like opened me up to a new world. Before that, I didn't really see art as a feasible, you know, like career. Um, but I got on there and I saw so many like, like inspiring images that really made me want to take photos of my own. So I asked my mom, hey, can I get a camera? And she was like, sure. And she got me a really bad like camcorder that I would just take pictures on in my gym class. Um, and ever since then I was taking photos. But yeah, um, I really thought it could be a career for me. So I decided that I was gonna go to the art institutes. So I went to um, a camp there and it was really fun. Um, but I decided that it wasn't for me because there wasn't really a campus life. So I decided to go to state and I'm, I'm really glad I went there. It's a really great school, have a lot of resources that I'm glad I'm able to use. Yeah, yeah, it's so interesting how a lot of us millennials have come to photography via like social media in a sense, like Tumblr and different things like that. Like that has definitely influenced so many of us. And um, I think that's valid. A lot of people don't talk about it enough, but these things like seeing imagery constantly and just feeling empowered by it, so to speak. So Astrid, going back to you with your work, can you explain about this intersection between photo and performance art that um, is happening with some of your pieces? Yeah, um, so, you know, I, what was really important to me uh, when it came to my performance work, which we'll, you'll see the, uh, the mirror, which is, do you see the beauty I see in you? Um, you know, uh, I grew up in Los Angeles and now I'm San Francisco. So these cities, these cities, cities are so liberal that it's like not restrictive in any way, but uh, people kind of restrict themselves because they are so harsh on themselves when they're looking in the mirror and so on. So um, the performance work actually started, uh, it was something I did like the first two weeks I attended CCA. Um, I just wanted to remind people not to be so hard on themselves in the mirror because that's also something I tell myself every day. Um, and I just wanted to do it in an unavoidable and vulnerable space. So I wrote, do you see the beauty I see in you in all the bathrooms in all the CCA campuses. Um, and this is something that my professor encouraged me to do because I was thinking something so different. And um, at some point I decided to um, hold an open mic and that was done in a span of two hours, not two hours, sorry, two days. And um, yeah, I brought four mirrors onto the stage and just wrote, do you see the beauty I see in you on all the four mirrors in front of people. Yeah, and something interesting that you said, Astrid, was the fact that um, being from Los Angeles, very liberal city, where the only restrictions people tend to put on themselves are um, they're doing it to themselves rather than the, the culture of the city doing it. Mm -hmm. And both of y'all's work kind of shows this way of like liberating folks and letting them step into their truths and exposing different communities essentially that, um, that you're highlighting. So I wanted to know, Nia, how do you feel about um, the, the type of communities, type of people that you're celebrating and highlighting? Like, is that an act of resistance growing up or like being in Georgia and Atlanta specifically, or how's, how is that city affecting those people and like what you're choosing to show? So I really think through my work that I'm like trying to destruct negative stereotypes that have been like established for the kind of area that I live in. Um, and the thing is, I love living over here. Like there's so many different personalities, so many different kinds of people. And like, I walk down the street and my entire neighborhood is having a barbecue and like sitting outside talking and playing cards and stuff. And it's just like really a beautiful community that gets the bad end of the stick. I don't know if that's how the met metaphor goes, but yeah, they get the bad end of the stick a lot of the time. Um, and uh, I'm sorry, I don't know what else to say. <laughs> well, just this idea of um, 
these folks, these communities that you're showing, like is, is them stepping into their truths and the way you're highlighting them, is that an act of resistance being in Georgia? Is Georgia, Atlanta, Georgia, as repressive as we think in the West or mm -hmm. can you speak to that? So I think it is an act of resistance since I'm trying to fight those stereotypes. Um, but Georgia itself, you would think that living in Atlanta, you would really think that it's a majority black city. Cause I feel like everywhere I go, I see so many people of color that it's kind of jarring to me when I go to other sides of town and it's like, you know, not as diverse. It, it kind of feels like in the area that I live in, there's just like a special bubble that cannot be burst by any kind of gentrification that is, you know, trying to come in and, you know, ruin what we've kind of built over here. Um, but yeah, I think it is a form of resistance. It's kind of saying, F you to the people who want to come and take this away from us and bulldoze and like build more parking lots. Yeah, and something I noticed that you spoke to in your work is this act of like being whoever you are, being who you want to be and like liberation, right? Can you speak yeah. to that? Theme? And then Astrid, I would love to hear your thoughts on that too with your work. So in my current work, I'm like making portraits of goth, LGBTQ women, people. Um, and I really like to show their individuality through style in these portraits that I'm making of them. Um, so basically we just make these pictures that are like highly collaborative. I just tell them, hey, you basically wanna be whoever you wanna be. And like, let's decide what you should wear and where we should go take the photos and you know, like wear whatever you wanna wear. Especially this photo that we're looking at right now. This is actually of my friend Jojo who, they have a lot of gender identity issues and were telling me that they were, un they were uncomfortable going out like at nighttime wearing whatever they wanted to wear because they actually like design clothes. So what you see them wearing is, you know, something they made. So I told them, hey, like, why don't we just go make some photos right now and you can be whoever you want to be in these images. And I think that that's kind of what my work is about. Like, yeah, just capturing individuality. And Astrid, how about you with your work? Um, so I've, before CCA, I was only doing fashion um, by very diverse communities, but now I'm more focused on nudes, but focusing on uh, different body shapes and sizes. And, um, you know, this started because, you know, I'm not only brown, but I'm a bigger girl. And, you know, just in media, you're, you're like, it's like you're being told like your body is not normal, um, like brown big nipples. Um, are not something that, you know, you see on media. So like, mm -hmm. I know that Cardi B, Cardi B's news are being shared a lot and it's very discouraging to see all these people bullying her online. But you know what, like I photographed myself and I photographed other people with different bodies and I just wanna show people that their body is normal and there's, it's perfect. Like there's nothing wrong with it. and. It's honestly amazing because um, with the nude series, I didn't really reach out to people. Uh, the moment I said I was doing that, people reached out to me and I was photographing a lot of these people without not really knowing them. Um, Definitely. Yeah, I noticed that common thread between the work. So between both of you. So what I wanted to know is the same question. How do we see the role of artists changing and shaping ideas and this imagining of like our world post COVID you know, post-election, how do you feel like what you're doing with your work, et cetera, as to that conversation or that potential, that possibility? I think that I'm able to speak to how people over here are kind of reacting to COVID because a lot of people don't actually believe in, you know, COVID and wearing masks and things like that. Um, so I think like, I don't know, it's something interesting about showing a portrait of somebody who's wearing a mask. I feel like before COVID, if you were to do that, it would just be like a, like you were making a statement by wearing this mask, but now it's like something that everybody can recognize. Oh, you're wearing a mask because you're outside and it's COVID. Um, but I think all artists are kind of having to conform to a very strenuous set of rules now. Like you can't really 
do things the way that you wanted to because I I really wanted to do a shoot with 10 to 12 women and I feel like I kind of can't do that right now because it's kind of putting everybody in danger and you kind of have to think about the greater good rather than the work that you kind of want to be putting out right now it's kind of hard and Astrid how about you um I definitely tried it out um so when COVID actually like the pandemic started uh I was in the process of still shooting my nude series and um at some point I was just on tinder asking people for nudes and I was uh creating collages out of it and that was interesting and um since then I feel like you just can't take art away from the artists and all of these people that I photograph are also artists, which is why they want to work with me. Um, yeah, I, I feel like the moment the restrictions kind of come off and, you know, maybe there's a cure, I, I can see it easily going back. But um, I just feel like what we're going through is just something that's just going to connect, going to connect us a lot more and create that uh, stronger connection with one another. Definitely. Thank you both. Thank you both for sharing your amazing work. And um, just thank you for that. And we'll touch more on it together when we're in a group at the end. So our next group is um, Elaine Moreno and Markeisha Thornton. And Markeisha is a student at Georgia State University and Elaine Moreno is a student at CCA. We'll start off with Markeisha. Can you please tell us a bit about your practice and your voting story? And if you are um, Georgia native, a little bit about your background. Sure. Um, so I am from Milwaukee, Wisconsin originally. And I now live in Atlanta, Georgia. Been here since about 2007. Um, I am a senior BFA major in the photography program. And in my work, I try to explore the complexities of politics and intersecting identities, and also try to explore what it means to be an African-American artist. Um, and for my um, voting story, I would say that I grew up in one of the most racially segregated cities, Milwaukee, Wisconsin, in the country. Um, it's still so to this day. Uh, and my, experience that, my experiences there were pretty much uneventful. Um, I was a voter during the whole Florida hanging Chad controversy. And at that time is when I really started to pay more attention to the delicacy of our voting system and how our elections don't always go the way of the will of the people. Um, but it wasn't until I moved to a predominantly white suburb in Atlanta that I really started to notice like scrutiny and microaggressions, um, everything from like overhearing people in line say, I bet they're only gonna vote for him because he's black, you know, regarding the Obama um, elections and, you know, scrutinizing, over scrutinizing our identification well before Georgia had the um, exact match law. Um, and I've even been questioned on whether or not I live in the district that of the polling place that I'm going to. So it's, it's, it's been a, a, a really eye opening change voting down here in the South. Mm -hmm. And Elaine, can you speak a little bit about your background, um, your Bay Area native, and your voting story, as well as a bit about your practice? Hello, everyone. Um, yeah, so I was born and raised here in the Bay Area, um, San Francisco and Richmond, California, specifically. And um, my experience voting here specifically in the Richmond area has been really, really easy. Um, my first time voting was Obama's second term. And so after that was uh, Donald Trump. And that was really um, kind of like just eye-opening for me specifically, just because I was starting to like understand 
and really, really think about how uh, the propositions are important, even though you're not really excited about the outcome of the president. So, and also just like specifically my image for my voting story is me and my parents. And I wanted to shed light on their experience specifically because somehow along over the years, their um, party got switched. And I feel like that really changed their like perspective and kind of were discouraged to do so. And so I feel like my role now, um, as far as voting has been to kind of like remind my parents to like, let's do the research and, you know, let's do this together and that it's okay, no matter, no matter the outcome, like we should still practice this as um, the right because they became citizens, you know, later on in their life. So I'm interested to know more about um, the exchange that happened and both of you having interviewed each other. And like, did you notice similarities, any overlaps when, um, when you spoke about these very nuanced things when, on the topic of voter suppression in particular, just the barriers to even be able to vote? Um, well, when we spoke, hi, Elaine, nice to see you again. <laughs> um, I think when we spoke, I, it was a difference in um, the, the voter suppression that, well, I haven't really, I haven't been denied voting, but I did share um, a story with Elaine about my daughter not receiving her absentee ballot. And I think that was kind of um, similar to what Elaine was saying about her parents and um, making sure that they were able to secure their vote. Yeah, I'm also interested. Um, oh, sorry, Elaine, go ahead. No, no, no go ahead, go ahead. <laughs> um, I also was interested, Markeisha, when you said um, they, at the polling booth, they started questioning, like, if you even lived in, you know, the district, et cetera. Are they, asking for like a bill or like proof of address? Like how does something like that work? Um, I, they didn't ask for anything um, other than they just, whoever the polling person was, just really didn't believe um, that I lived at my address. Um, asked me, you know, how long did I live there? And um, have I voted at this polling place before? Am I at the right polling place? And I'm like, yep. Yeah, I'm, I'm at the right place. <laughs> I know I'm, you know, I'm at the right place. So um, it was just, it was, it was odd. And I noticed that not a lot of other people were getting that question. Um, and I, and I do think that it might have been this particular um, polling person just had an issue that I don't know. Yeah, yeah, I understand what you're saying. It sounds like um, it could have been racial profiling, essentially, depending on what area you were in, which is right. interesting how that comes up too when it comes to, to voting. So something else I wanted to ask was, um, can you speak to your approach to storytelling using photography? Um, while we're on your work, Elaine, maybe you could start us off with that question. Yeah, I think my approach is very personal and like I guess I want to emphasize on like exploring my and accepting my vulnerability as a um, as a the youngest in my family and just kind of like what I'm going through with my family right now and the work that I'm making is shedding light on this issue of immigration like this other side of immigration, of immigrant parents, of wanting to return back and retire in their home, uh, in their like native land. And so I think that my way of showing like my work and expressing it is very, like I want it to be as relatable as possible, like humanly relatable as possible. Because, you know, if you don't have, you know, your, your biological mother and father, it's like, it's okay, like you still have your mom and dad, whoever they are to you in your life. Like, I think I just want to be able to show the world that, you know, we're human and we're like the same. Definitely. And Markeisha, I noticed in a lot of your work, there are page numbers 
that reference um, the Toni Morrison book, The Bluest Eye, that you were inspired for with your series. Can you speak to that? I thought that was really interesting and clever how you did that. So the page numbers are pretty much where I got the, um, the idea for the, the photo. There is usually a line or a quote or a passage on that page that really inspired um, the composition of the photo. And I didn't want to put the exact title out there. Um, I wanted to just put the page number there so that hopefully the viewer will go and research and explore and read it and figure out um, either what passage that photo is referencing or maybe find a connection between that photo and something similar on the page for themselves. Thank you, yeah, I really enjoyed that, like seeing that. Um, also, full disclosure, it's one of my favorite Toni Morrison books. So I was just like, oh, wow, this is awesome. Um, so what I wanna speak to too is just this idea of um, with your unique voter stories that you shared um, Elaine, like, how has that affected you, like, having to translate to your family or explain to them in different ways, like, how to vote in a sense, right? Like, how is that affecting you when you vote? And with Markeisha, like, with your daughter being denied her ballot and just how you're having to navigate this, um, having gone through a few elections, just, I'm interested in that. That's a different, different position to be in where you're kind of accountable for someone else's vote. So... Like I said before, I am the youngest. I have uh, two older siblings and I'm still the one that's living at home with my parents. And I think it's such a cultural thing, like, you know, living with your parents until you get married, until you have to leave. Um, and so I feel like it's a responsibility that I'm happy to take and happy to help because it's just, again, just like reinforcing and reminder of my parents that it is important. Like you, if you're here in this country and you know you're providing so much uh, to the communities, like you should also be able to practice this right. Um, yeah, what was the other part of the question? Sorry. Just this idea of you being accountable for someone else along with your own vote and just like how that can affect how you look at voting in general. Yeah, I mean like, sorry, I think also just this has allowed me to just be as real as possible with my parents. Um, and like letting them know like these are my opinions and like still having a mutual respect even though you know they're very religious and have a particular way of, of seeing uh, the world. Um, I'm still very grateful that you know they they can be open-minded um, and so if anything I think it's like bringing us closer in a sense even though we have our differences. Yeah and Markeisha I'm really interested to hear your perspective. Um, I think my daughters are in their 20s and um, all of them are registered to vote. And as they get older, they are taking a lot of the responsibility of figuring out what um, the candidates stand for, who's up for election, um, when the voting um, occurs and things of that nature. Um, I do still kind of feel that it's necessary to um, keep them abreast of um, this is happening, um, get your absentee ballot um, request in soon enough, trying to make sure that I have information for if they have questions, they can get those answers from me. But they are pretty, um, they're pretty smart and pretty resourceful. And um, I've, I've loosened up the reins on that. I, you know, I, I feel very secure in the fact that they will um, vote the way that they, that they want to vote and that they, that they will vote. <laughs> Definitely. And similar question as I've been asking everyone tonight is how do you see the role of artists changing and shaping as well as imagining a post COVID world um, in light of the election? Do we have influence on you know, shifting the tide. I just want to hear your personal opinion on it. Um, I think that in this election year, which really seems to be very divisive, a little more divisive than others that I can remember, um, I think that the role of artists can really take on a really great um, 
it can it can be really great to see an artist just um, critique society and and show us where we've fallen short and maybe advocate for us to do better and um, which will unite us towards a common good. And I also think that artists can use their work in this moment to expose the truth of the matters like COVID-19, how is it really affecting, like take the, the politics out of it and how is it really affecting us as citizens and what are we really going to bring it back down to a personal level and just really show that truth and it's a good moment for artists right now. It's a lot of it's a lot of um, topics out there that we can tackle from COVID to the election to the protests to um, just being in solitude and how that's affecting people differently. So I think it's a really good moment for artists to really dive in and do some great work. And Elaine. Yeah, I mean, I, I agree with Markeisha, but also like the reality of this is that the pandemic is like engraved in us, right? Like we've all like just being indoors and like all going through the similar like similarities. Um, I think that artists are going to continue to create work regardless of the time and and using the env their environments to, um, you know, either express or uh, voice for other people who can't. Um, yeah, I think that if we just like stick together and remember to vote and, you know, just like be as positive as possible, um, that something good can come out of this. Definitely. Thank you too for that lovely hearing from you. And we're going to bring the panel all together to discuss some um, things in tandem with one another. So is everyone here? Okay. So um, I'll turn it over to go through the um, the Q and A. Um, let's yeah, see. absolutely. Um, I have a list of questions here that were put into the chat throughout, and um, the first ones I'm I'm not really a hundred percent sure the context of it. Uh, it's from Laura Reed to Tyler, and she asked, "What do you mean by safe?" Um, I think yeah. I was talking about how people are going to be doing nothing but landscapes and self portraits because of COVID. And I meant that those, what I meant, if that's what I was saying, um, what I meant was like, it's literally going to be safer because you're not going to have to be around people to take those, to make that kind of art. So I wasn't trying to bash landscapes or self portraits or anything. Okay. <laughs> I love both of those things, but, <laughs> but so that's what I meant. Yes, it's just COVID related. <laughs> the next one is to Riley and Halsum. Uh, did you come to exchange with each other with any particular ideas about each other's experiences? Were there any surprises? Um, well, I thought I was, I was really interested in hearing Halsum's experience, but then also how we had really similar ideas as far as like our political views. And I thought that was really cool to share that with him. Um, could you, I'm, I'm sorry, uh, could you repeat the, the question again? Yeah. Um, how did you come to exchange with each other or did you come to the exchange with each other with any particular ideas about each other's experiences and were there any surprises? Um, yes, because uh, I've never been to Georgia and um, so uh, to me everything is su pretty surprised to me and um, um, and I remember we talked about uh, how to have uh, conversations with our uh, conservative parents and uh, I do want to share a little bit about my method to uh, to this this issue. And um, to me, I would just um, if I sense some kind of possibility to go um, to go into a, a like a sensitive social issue topic with my dad or with my mother, um, I would just jump to another topic because um, I don't want to I don't want to directly 
have like a debate with my parents. And also I still want to convey my, um, how to say like ideology or my thoughts uh, about the, about the society to my parents. So I would just, um, um, I would just, I've been, I've been emphasizing the importance of equality when I, um, you know, talking to my parents. Um, another question in the chat that I saw that was um, really important for the whole panel is how aware were you of voter suppression before this election? And what responsibilities do you feel um, to address it? That was part of the exchange of just hearing these things. Some of you were totally unaware. So I'm just wanting to know some clarification around that. Um, so we watched a video as uh, both of the classes from distant. Um, sorry, it was hot. Um, and it was a video about uh, voter suppression in Georgia. And one of my roommates uh, moved in during quarantine and he's from Georgia. And as like, I was watching it, taking notes and just like jaw on the ground. Cause I was, I am from Texas, which is like not the South. It's like its own weird thing over there. Um, but I was just like in disbelief that like, I had never heard my family, my friends, like anyone talk about it. And I went and like ran into my roommate's room and I was like, do you know what's happening in like the place that you grew up? Like, and he was like, yeah, like that's like a really like known thing. And a couple of my other roommates are from the South. And I was just like, how is like no one really talking about that or like combating that? And I feel like more so recently with like a lot of people doing the mail-in voting that's been talked about. But prior to this election, I feel like at least me personally didn't really know about it. So yeah, I just want to like, I text my friends back home and I was like, like, we got to do our part. Like, I don't know. It's just really interesting to hear none of that throughout my entire life until maybe a month ago. So what I'm really interested in is I'm hearing a lot of like the CCA students, like the West Coasters feeling, explaining how they've never heard of this. Like it's baffling. How do the Georgia students feel about this? Like, this is your reality all the time. Like this is commonplace, but this idea of like different parts of the country having no idea what's going on over there and how shocked we are to hear it versus you living that year after year. Um, can you explain that for the folks at Georgia State? Like, how do you feel hearing us like be so surprised at something that's just common practice there? I think that as a black person, um, you grow up with this history of knowing of all of the issues with voter rights and um, learning that how we fought to get those rights and you take voting very seriously. And so, and you know, and there's always this cloud over you that this can be taken away or that this can be suppressed um, or just how delicate it is um, at any moment. And I think that it's, it's not really surprising to me when I hear people in other parts of the country say they didn't know that things were going on because the media and the people that are doing the suppressing do a great job of hiding it and making us feel like when we talk about it, that we're making it up, that these things aren't true. So it doesn't surprise me one bit. Yeah. And I'm wondering, like in these conversations as well, this is open ended for everyone. Um, were you surprised at like the similarities that y'all had in common, either with um, the work that you're making or just personal background? Was that expected? Um, me and Astrid had a lot in common. Like our practices are very similar, but the way that we approach it is really different. And it's really interesting to see that that even across the country, people are, you know, being affected by things the same way that I am and making work as sensitive as I am. Um, and it, to answer your first question, mm -hmm. I, I always really knew about voter suppression because like Markeisha said, um, I feel like I grew up hearing about how they were, you know, giving out polling tests and stuff and doing all these things to stop people of color from voting. Um, so I feel like my mother was always, you know, hammering into my head that it's something very important that we should all be going to do. 
um, and telling me, my father would tell me how my great, great grandma Daisy was a slave and how she couldn't vote and how his, his mother um, couldn't vote a lot of times because they were, you know, doing these polling tests that were making it very difficult for them to vote. So it just was always something that I was aware of. And like Marcus just said, it is, it's not really surprising that people don't know about it, but it's kind of also surprising because I, I feel like I learned in school, even like a little bit about um, like the way that they were suppressing votes against black people. So it's kind of, maybe maybe it's an understanding like to where people thought that it wasn't happening anymore. Like, you know, people think racism doesn't happen anymore. Mm -hmm. Maybe it's just that, um, but also, you know, California is a very liberal place. So I feel like a lot of things that are commonplace here and a lot of like microaggressions and racism that we deal with here is, not really commonplace in California. Definitely. And how did all of you feel when you found similarities in each other's work, being that, you know, and this idea of like, do you feel like work is, can be regionally um, specific or more universal, I guess? Just the overlap in what you were creating, like it's similar themes, different parts of the country, but the themes still resonate. They still are the same. How did you feel? Um, saying that I was gonna say that I've traveled to Georgia so when me and Mia were talking um, I was kind of telling her how when I went there my impression was that it's super liberal and I because everything I saw was all about civil rights and Martin Luther King so I could have never imagined that all of this other stuff was going on because my entire week there was all about learning you know just about my own civil rights and how I have the freedom to do whatever I want now <laughs> or have or being encouraged to do whatever I want and speaking for others because to me that's how America is shaped and um yeah like I it, it was insane to just even see like conservative flags around Atlanta but I just assumed that it wasn't like the majority um opinion yeah yeah, like I was saying earlier in my artist talk, it Atlanta kind of feels like a bubble that once you go outside, like you go a little bit more south or even a little bit more north of Atlanta, it just really vastly changes. Like it, it can go from really liberal and, you know, Little Five Points, which is like an, a modern area where everybody, a modern area where it's like all spray painted and stuff. And then it can go to like, stoic homes and stuff where you might get shot which isn't funny but you know what I mean yeah there's also some personal like some affirmations in the um the chat for each of y'all's practice by um Nelson Chan um you can read some of them um it says Morgan's photographs are very much about the outside world but seems to be her internal meditation on how to navigate through it emotionally, technologically, or geographically. Tyler's work seems to be an exploration of how to create one's inner world to the outside. Do you feel like that's an accurate read or like a good summation of what you're looking at? Morgan and Tyler. <laughs> um, yeah, I mean, I feel like I, I feel like every day, like people are just like, I feel like someone said this in their talk too, like just trying to figure out your place in the world and like how to interact with it. So yeah, I really feel like quarantine, like just hit me like a train, like dealing with emotions, dealing with like the fact that the outside world is here, but like there's like such like unknown of, am I supposed to go outside? Can I go outside? Like, am I at risk in just like so many unknowns? Um, yeah, it's been a whirlwind of a year. Yeah, um, I think that's a pretty good assessment of how I've been expressing things through my work. I mean, it's, it's just like trying to get the inward struggles out in a way that you can express them to everybody that makes sense, you know? I'm trying to do it in an intuitive, hopefully intelligent way. So, you know, that sort of struggle. And um, I like that, like, when me and Morgan talked, like, I like that, I feel like we have different approaches to things, you know, but it was, I don't know, I, I feel like I learned a lot just from seeing someone else's practice, you know, like, just to see 
like someone across all the way across the country is like having the same kind of struggles and and like when you were taking pictures of people from your window and all like I could definitely relate to that you know like just trying to find something to make art with you know yeah is, it's it's a very real struggle that I think we can all relate to so <laughs> this one is for Nia and Astrid uh, this is also from Nelson. Um, can Nia and Astrid talk about their process of collaborating with the models in their photographs? I'm curious how the models see themselves in your work. Was there a connection or tension between your visions and your sitter's expectations? Or was there a shared transcendence that happens? Sometimes it can be really scary working with another person because I tell them my vision for the shoot and it's probably not the exact same as what they are envisioning in their head and it kind of like makes me anxious to like <laughs> make these images and then them not like them um which has happened sometimes you know people are like hey I look ugly in that picture and I'm like that is a gorgeous photo the light looks amazing and I'm sorry but I have to use it um so I feel like there might be some kind of disconnect there but usually the models um, like I said, my shoots are like highly collaborative between me and the model. Like we choose together where we're gonna shoot it at, what they're gonna wear, um, cause there's usually a specific mood. Um, as for like my portraiture that I was doing like on the street in my neighborhood, that was really just like me walking up to people that I thought looked interesting and being like, hey, can I take a photo of you? And sometimes they'd be like, hey, can I, can I get your Instagram so I can get that photo? And I'd be like, yeah, of course, but I probably won't post it, but thank you. <laughs> yeah um okay so actually that's interesting to hear because I actually started uh asking random people if I can photograph them <laughs> so that was my foundation and to be honest um I feel like I'm, I'm a really big extrovert and I understand now as an adult that I bring a lot of comfort out of people and people actually depend on that for me so I know I can get that comfort out of everyone just because I'm, if you're gonna, there's no way to shock me at this point in my life. Like I, I'm super open and accepting. Like for example, my mom called me last night because she's 50 years old and she's decided that she's gonna change her entire career. And that's something that I've already done. So she was just calling me for that confirmation because she needed to feel reassured. And like, that's my relationship with my parents. Um, but yeah, like, I actually am so thankful right now because I feel like I'm at a good place as an artist. Um, I would say I was just hired, for example, uh, for my first uh, official like fashion shoot. And I've gotten full access to creativity because the person hired me because they love my artistic style. And uh, even though it's her um, fashion line, she trusts that I will photograph it correctly. Um, and she, she knows at this point that I will come up with much more expansive ideas as the photograph, or sorry, the photo shoot progresses. And that's actually something that I get from all the people I work with and all my clients. Like, um, yeah, like me talking to people and feeling them, like uh, the creative sparks just come to my brain and I really know how to express people in these photographs above and beyond. So I'm always guaranteeing that you are gonna be amazed by whatever we shoot together. Congratulations on that. That's something I love to hear is this idea of during COVID, a lot of artists surprisingly got a lot of opportunities during this time, especially after the protests, which is something that is also very nuanced about this year, this feeling like maybe art is gonna stop because everything is quiet, we're in quarantine. But at the same time, it's it's opening up more doors than ever, um, in particular for artists of color, what I've noticed. Mm -hmm. So another question is, Hausam, can you share some thought, some, some more about your voting story piece? What is your take on the conversation about socialism as it plays out in the US? Um, if you have to share on that. Yeah, uh, so I feel like the key, uh, one of the keywords in my, um, the image uh, of, my voting story is ambiguity, and it's um, it's a keyword in my uh, in my role in the 2020 election because I I don't get the I, I don't have the right to vote, and also um, it's live within the um, my 
a comprehension uh, of the social the term socialism because um, in that image in that imagery you can see the Bernie Sanders um, ads on the ground and um, and Bernie Sanders is a candidate who um, self proclaimed I, I think self proclaimed is uh, as a, a socialist in um, in this election but um, related related to my background I come from China which is also a self-proclaimed socialist country. And I know um, this ideology or this methodology about social sciences, I just put it here, it's a lie. And, and also uh, I feel like it's pretty interesting to explore um, my interpretation of this term because I don't think Bernie is like a complete socialist. And that's why I kind of advocate for him and um, I don't think housing for all is a socialist method because it's, you know, we have like it's a basic human right. So, um, so yeah, if you zoom in the uh, my image of um, the voting store, you can see a lot of like countless of half tone dots. That I feel like it's a symbolic, uh, it's it's a symbol of um, my ambiguity. Uh, no matter is my no matter as my role uh, as my role in this country, or as my um, interpretation of the, you know this kind of social science aspect. Definitely, and a question was there for um, Markeisha. As a parent, what are your thoughts when looking at Elaine's photographs of her parents in such intimate moments? Um, I thought they were beautiful, and I really. Appreciate um, as a parent when your 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 children kind of think of you as you know a parent. They don't um, they see you one way, and and I think um, as parents, when your kids get older, we kind of want them to see us more as not just parents, but on a human and level. And I think that Elaine's photos really did that for her parents, and I thought that was very beautiful. Thank you for that. And we're almost at time, unfortunately. Um, I just want to say thank you again for everyone just sharing your thoughts about this, sharing your work, speaking about it to this audience. Um, it was so nice to have such a mixed audience of folks from different parts of the country, seeing all of your work, hearing from you, dispelling these myths of like how the West views the South and the South views the West and just learning about the nuances in between there. It seems like there was a lot of shared similarities and commonalities that, um, were a surprise to some of us and expected from others. But at the end of the day, I feel like we came to like a better understanding of each other. And also just, you know, this the power of the vote and what's happening with that. Just hearing these things so we can all be aware and we can't claim ignorance to these things anymore. Um, I do want to turn it over to Dave. Thank you so much, Chanel. I, you know, we spend so much time on Zoom. It's easy to say, oh, that was a great, 90 minutes on Zoom to come out feeling as inspired as I think many of us who are watching right now feel is really wonderful. Thank you all so much for being here. Chanel, you've been incredibly generous with San Francisco Cranmer work in many ways. Thank you for moderating. So many of you students who are here, it's incredibly inspiring. We have people here from the Bay Area, people in Atlanta, people from all over the country. Please come back. One of the tiny silver linings of this impossible time is that it's allowed us to come together in ways that we might not have had a collaborative event with Georgia and San Francisco before. And, and we're all learning together because we're able to do this. So thank you all for participating. Please come back. Um, you know, usually I, I, I give a pitch for everybody to become a member and support camera work. Um, it's also just showing up. We exist to have conversations like this and to see work like the work that you all are producing. So I hope to see you at San Francisco Camera Work again. So thanks again to Chanel, Aspen Mays, thank you. Uh, we're grateful to you for, to all of you for sharing uh, your images and stories. And of course, I wanna give a shout out to Christina Graber. She helped us make the connection with, with Aspen and as always uh, helps us to produce these events. Uh, I wanna give you all a shout out. Uh, I wanna give a shout out to what's coming up next. Uh, and I hope you'll join us again. We have an event coming up on Tuesday the 20th with Christopher Colville. He makes really interesting photographs with gunpowder. We also have a conversation with Bin Don. He makes beautiful daguerreotypes, that original photographic process 
uh, of Western landscapes. And I think particularly to this group, what will be really interesting, and uh, Chanel, we're gonna tap you to help us promote this as well, of course, we'll be launching our next juried exhibition, Forecast 2020, uh, at the end of the month. And we have 12 incredible artists that I hope you all uh, check out. Chanel was one of those artists uh, last year, and we will be having talks and events with them uh, throughout the month of November. So please come back to Camera Work. We'd love to see you again. Uh, and visit our website at sfcamerawork.org to see the latest of what's coming up next. Again, thank you all for coming. You are the reason camera work exists. So hopefully, I'll see you again soon. Have a wonderful evening. And I think the right thing for all of us to end this evening on is to say, if you haven't already, let's go out and vote. And uh, let's, let's be the change we need so that people aren't waiting for hours uh, for the next election. Thank you all so much for being here. And we'll see you again soon. Bye. Thank you, everyone. Thank you, everyone. Bye. Thank you. Hi, thank you.